Many of you know we're in the second part of our sermon series on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul introduces this famous chapter on love in chapter 12, verse 31, where he writes, And now I will show you the most excellent way. The most excellent way is a life of love. Our lesson on love, then, will begin with some of our favorite characters, Charlie Brown and Lucy. And you can see that in a cartoon strip, they're talking, and everything is coming up roses, and everything is just fine with Lucy and Charlie Brown. Until Charlie Brown waxes kind of philosophical and suggests to Lucy that what the world really needs is love. Fair enough, right? What the world really needs is love. Lucy, though, doesn't like that. Lucy shoots back, and she gets really angry with that statement. Lucy says to Charlie Brown, you blockhead, don't you get it? I love the world, it's just people that I can't stand. (laughs) Oh, we, we understand that, right? You came to church this morning probably thinking, oh, I love the world, it's just a few people that are kind of making life difficult for me. I love the world, it's just people I sometimes can't stand. For all of the Lucys out there, which includes me, we have a lesson on love. In chapter 13, verse 5, we have these words penned by Paul. Love, we said last week, the Greek term there is agape. It means unconditional love. That's the word Paul uses nine times in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This agape, this unconditional love, is not easily angered, angered. To begin, we need to understand that anger isn't always a sin. Fair enough? In fact, sometimes anger is an appropriate response. If someone that you love is hurt, like a wife or a child, the proper response if you love them is to get what? You get kind of angry. You're mad, right? Uh, To not show love uh, when someone is hurt is to be apathetic. So the opposite of love is not anger. Everybody got that? The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is apathy, indifference, being aloof. I don't care. So anger per se is not the problem today. It's how we manage our anger that is the problem every day. (laughs) Some of you clam up, others of you blow up. Some of you stuff it down, others of you let it all hang out. Some of you are like that turtle, right? You crawl into your shell and you're merry martyr. Others of you are like Mount Vesuvius, right? Like a volcano. And you blow up. There's a dirty little secret in America, you probably know it. Every year in America, four million wives are beaten by their husbands. Four million. Husbands who don't know how to manage their anger. Every year in America, 10 million children, 10 million children are beaten by their parents. Parents who don't know how to manage their anger. We truly do live in the age of rage, in the age of outrage. So how do I tame my temper? Four points I want to make today. First one is this. How do I tame my temper? Resolve to manage it. Resolve to manage. You say, well, easier said than done. Oh, I understand that. (laughs) I understand that. The proverb writer says, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. 
In other words, a, a fool, a foolish man or woman or child gives full vent to our anger. You see, we say, I can't help it. You made me angry. That's a very weak person that says that. You make me Folks, no one makes you feel anything. You okay with that? No one makes you feel anything. Your feelings are always a choice. They always are. If you think that you have no control over your feelings, then what does the proverb writer say? A wise man or woman keeps himself under control. Keeps indicates that that I can manage my anger. Anger is a choice. The Bible says resolve to manage it. Now, now, when do I resolve to manage it? I don't resolve to manage my anger when my face is flush and my teeth and hands are clenched and adrenaline is running through my body and my face is flush. Folks, at that point, we've lost. Now, if I'm going to resolve to manage anger, I need to understand this word resolve. I need to do it before the event. You understand what I'm saying here? Teachers, before you walk into that classroom, thinking of that child, say, today I'm not going to let that child get to me. I'm resolving beforehand. If you work in an office and you're going to a meeting, you pray. Oh, God, help me before this meeting begins, because it's going to be kind of tense. Before you get home, husbands, you open up that door, resolve to manage your anger. It's the first point, that anger is manageable. The wise person keeps himself, herself, under control. Second point in taming our temper would be this. Remember the cost. Remember the cost. See, this is just a standard truth of life. When it's going to cost me a whole lot, (laughs) boy, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down. If I see a policeman behind me and I've seen a sign in front of me that uh, finds her double in work zones, You see what I'm saying here? I'm going to slow down. It's going to cost me a whole lot. How much does anger cost you? It'll cost you a whole lot, won't it? If we understand the cost, we'll slow down a little bit next time, right? We'll put on the brakes because there's a heavy price tag to pay when we let it all hang out. Look what the proverb writer says. The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. When you lose your temper, you lose a lot, don't you? Uh, We've all lost the respect of our children when we've lost our temper. Uh, You can lose your job, can't you? Uh, You can lose your marriage. Uh, You can lose your health. Some people have lost everything because they can't tame their temper. What's the number one reason why people don't count the cost? Where they just let it all blow up like Mount Vesuvius. What's the number one reason? You know. Too much to drink. You just had too much to drink. (laughs) It's alcohol, and most of the time, when you are under the influence, you say and do things that are going to cause great harm to people. So resolve. Resolve to manage it. We can, to some extent, know that there's a price to pay, a heavy price. You may not have to pay the bill next month, but I'll guarantee someday that bill will come due. Third point, reflect before reacting. Reflect before reacting. 
A lot of anger management is simply mouth management. You with me on this, right? If I can manage my mouth, I can probably manage my anger. Again, Proverbs is so picturesque, isn't it? For as churning the milk produces butter, and it most certainly will, and as twisting the nose produces blood, just take my word for it, right? (laughs) So stirring up anger produces strife, strife. It's a cause and effect verse, right? You do something and you can count that there will be an effect. You churn the milk, you'll get butter. You twist your nose, you'll get bloody. You stir up anger and it won't ever be pretty. So we reflect. We reflect. What we're saying is that the best anger management sometimes is to hit the pause button. Hit the delay button. In fact, I just had to do that recently. <laughs> it is, as soon as you're upset and hurt, the first response is to strike back. Let them have it. They won't see what's coming. Bam! They deserve it. <laughs> no, that will just produce more strife. Hit the pause button. You get an email that you don't like, don't respond within the next minute. Someone's hurt you. Don't get on social media, on Facebook or Twitter, or or text them back. Not immediately. Delay. Reflect. Reflect. Pause. Cause a time out to happen. If you're in a heated discussion, (laughs) or let's just call it a fight, and things are getting out of hand, Because they can. You understand, the longer you're with someone, the more ammunition you've got. I've been married to Lisa for 33 years. And she's been married to me for 33 years. So I better think twice before I start firing bombs. Right? So I hit the pause button. I hit the delay. I call a timeout. I say, you know, this isn't going anywhere. We're just hurting each other very deeply, so we're going to stop. That's reflecting before reacting. Now, you don't want to do that for too long. That is to say, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. What does that mean? Anger is like a little kitty cat, right? In your lap, and and it's purring, and you're petting it. Oh, look at this cute little cat. And then the sun goes down, and you don't deal with it. And then the sun goes down, and on and on. And pretty soon, you don't have a little kitty cat. you got a roaring lion. (laughs) So you delay, but not for months. Not for years, because when we delay the anger too long, something even worse happens. And what would that be? Resentment. And resentment is always wrong. So resolve to manage it. Remember the cost. Reflect, reflect, right? Before you react... And then you got to do something about it, right? We have to release it somehow. We get that. It's like a boiling tea kettle, right? I got to do something about this. So how do I release it? I can think of several options, all of which I have tried, by the way, all right? Repress it. Repress it. What does that look like? Stuff it down. Clam up. Don't talk about it. Be that little tortoise in the shell, right? Just don't address it. Repress it. Repress it. Are you mad? No, I'm not. Is there a problem? Not at all. Are you upset? Never. See, we all kind of do that sometimes, right? We pose, we pretend, we posture as though it's just fine. No, it's not. There's a word 
for repressed anger. Do you know what that word is? It's called depression. Depression. <sighs> repressed anger isn't the only cause to depression. We get depressed about a lot of stuff, right? But repressed anger is the number one cause of depression. It's like frozen rage that we just swallow day after day. And it destroys us. Well, another option to release your anger is to express it, right? Express it. Express it. A lot of people think of anger this way. You've got a bucket in your heart, and that bucket fills up with anger. There's bad drivers, there's bad politics, there's bad teams. So you just get angry. And so the, the conventional wisdom is, is that you take your bucket of anger, and every now and then you empty it. Right? Kind of like getting your oil changed in your car. You just take your bucket and you empty it. You express it. And then you're good. You're good for, you know, six months. There's only one problem with that, folks. It doesn't work. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but you don't have a bucket of anger in your heart. You've got a factory of anger. We all do. Especially, especially if you are an adult child of alcoholic parents. You have got a 24-7 factory of anger. And if you just think you've got a little bucket, well, there's a whole lot more anger from whence that came. You see, aggression creates more aggression. Anger begets more anger. All the studies show that when I fly off the handle, I am more likely to do it the next time. Not less likely, folks, more likely to do it. So anger becomes a pattern. Anger becomes my habit. This is how I react to life. So if repressing it only hurts myself and expressing it just destroys all the people around me, what are my options? i got to deal with it somehow. How about this? Confess it. You can talk to a counselor, a Stephen minister. That's all really good, right? A good friend, confess it to that person. That can be very healing. But, but finally, <laughs> the final solution to our anger is to confess it to God, <laughs> right? And not only say, God, I'm angry, God, I'm ticked off, but tell him why. God, I'm angry because it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. God, I'm angry because I'm scared. God, I'm angry because I'm insecure. And what will God do about it? Paul Harvey, you know who Paul Harvey is, right? Radio personality. He tells great stories. One of Paul Harvey's stories is about a woman who is out driving her husband's brand new car <laughs> and she got in a wreck and she was a wreck she was a mess she thought what am I going to do this is my husband's brand new car it's his dream car and now look it's something like this what am I going to say to my husband uh, the guy involved in the other car said well I'm sympathetic but, but we need to share some information. Get out your, your driver's license, and I need to see proof of insurance. So that's what the lady did. Paul Harvey, page two. As this woman went to the glove compartment to get out the necessary information, on top of everything was a written note. And, and this is what it said. Honey, if you've just been in an accident... Remember, it's you I love and not the car. Isn't that great? <laughs> Remember, it's you I love, not the car. When you and I <laughs> so frequently dent and ding and damage and destroy people with our mismanaged anger, what does God do when we confess it? 
He says, remember, it's you that I love. You understand that, that there is a note in the glove compartment, and it's a really long note. It's called the Bible. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know. This I know. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. And the Bible points again and again and again and again to the proof of God's love. And that would be Jesus. In only two verses in the Bible... God directly says, I love you. And not you plural, but you singular. Two verses. They're amazing verses. And they're both in the Old Testament. Who would have thought? Isaiah 43, verse 4. God says, you are precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. We know God loves the world, John three sixteen, But in this verse, the you is singular. You're precious and honored. And God says, I love you. Only one other time in the Bible does God say, first person direct speech to a singular you. I love you. I I love you this much. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3. I love you, singular you, with an everlasting love. This is not the story of Cinderella. (laughs) Cinderella was beautiful. Cinderella was hardworking. Cinderella was perfect. No, our story is not the Cinderella story. Our story is the mean stepmother part, right? Let's be honest. We're the conniving stepsisters. We're the mess in all of this. And yet, and yet... Wonder of wonders, miracle of miracles, God still says, I love you personally, passionately, dearly, everlastingly. And what's that mean for us today? Don't take your anger and repress it. It will kill you. Don't express it. That kills everybody else. What do you do? Confess it. And what will this God do? He will forgive it. He will cleanse it. He will help you deal with it every single time. Every time, Pastor Lessing, that's right. Every time. How can we be so sure? (laughs) You've known it since you were knee-high to grasshopper. This Jesus loves me. This I know. For from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible, (laughs) it tells me so. Open up your glove compartments. You've got a note. 